Welcome to a place. We call home. We are a church of grace, truth, and compassion. Worshiping God. Growing families. Reaching communities. Welcome to Hinsdale Seventh day Adventist Church. Sabbath Church family, I'm glad you chose to join us for worship today. I want to welcome you with words from Psalm 33. Very simple. It says, Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Praise looks good on us. And I'm glad that we chose to worship today. Please bow your heads with me in prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for placing us together for connecting us through this medium of technology. It's been 10 weeks since we've been apart. We pray today that you will speak to us through your word, that you will refresh us through all that we hear, through the songs that we sing, through the words we receive uh, from Pastor Salius today. Thank you for answering our prayer. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, it is now time for the pastor's corner. This week, the pastoral staff wanted to take a moment to highlight a ministry of our church that has, over the last two and a half months, done an amazing job. Do you know what ministry I'm talking about? I'm talking about our Sabbath school ministry. Yes. And let me be more specific, in a very special way, I'm talking about our Sabbath school teachers. You know, because of the coronavirus, many of our ministries have not been able to be active. But when it comes to our Sabbath school ministry, our church has continued to be active. They have relentlessly and tirelessly devoted and sacrificed time in order to continue to bring you Sabbath school class. And for that, we want to take a moment to say thank you. We're not just talking about one class. We're talking about whether it be the beginner's class, whether it be the kindergarten class, whether it be the primary class, whether it be the youth class, whether it be the young adult class, whether it be the Hispanic class, whether it be the adult Sabbath school class. All of these teachers have done an amazing job of continuing to minister to our church community. And we just want to take a moment to say thank you. Don't think for one moment that we don't appreciate the sacrifices that you made. Don't think for one moment that we take them for granted. You have done an incredible job of ministering to our church in this very difficult time. And for that, we want to say thank you. Good morning.
morning, children. It's time for the children's story. So don't forget to uh, take your offering money, put it in an envelope, and have it ready next time we can go back to church. Or maybe give it to your parents so that they can drop it off by church or put it in the mail. Oh, about 55 years ago, a group of us, in this particular day, it was Gary, Bill, Craig, Jeff, my brother Matt, and I, we would ride our bikes to about this location here on Jane Street. But at that time, it was an apple tree. To get to the apple tree, we would have to pass a farmhouse where Jefferson Junior High School is now. The road was a dirt road and it was filled with potholes. They had this dog and we would race by the farmhouse to get away from the dog to get to the apple tree. Those apples must have been well worth it. Today's parents would probably be cringing that we'd eat apples off of an apple tree, but we'd polish them up on our shirts. Well, this particular day, we were all racing as fast as we could go. And my brother was on my left-hand side. I remember looking over and seeing my brother there. And next thing I remember is we're laying in the ground. The dog is running on by, barking away, and my brother is getting up. We had fallen, and blood is pouring out of his head. My brother had to ride his bike home. Let's follow the path. All in all, it was about a mile to get home, and you could follow it like breadcrumbs. There were blood drops all along the way because my brother's head was bleeding. Once I was able to get my wits about me, I got up on my bike, turned it around, and raced home as fast as I could. But my brother on that spider bike of his, he was much faster. Plus, he was bleeding, so he was scared probably, and he was riding just as fast as he could. All in all, it was about a mile, and we came up to our home. Last week I was talking with my brother and I told him that I wanted to tell the story. And uh, we talked about uh, the scar he has on his head. When he got home, the neighbor who was a nurse came running over and by the time I got home, she had a pair of scissors and she was cutting the hair off of his head to take a look at the wound on his top of his head. The wound was about three inches long and about a half inch wide. So let's give you an idea about what that really looks like. So here's a piece of paper and you can see the idea, the length and the width. But let me cut the paper out so you have a better idea as to what it looks like because this is just a piece of paper. And, and also let's just cut here and cut here. So I'm cutting the paper right here and, and all. So this would be about the size of it and it was on the back I'm bald okay but it was on the back of his head like right about here so that's a pretty good size you know cut on the back of his head you know well the hair never grew back he always has this and I know the size because he uh, last week when I told him about the story he went and measured it for us that is a physical scar my brother has had to wear for the last 55 years or so. I've also had a scar, the scar internally that you can't see of thinking about I was the one who caused the scar uh, by causing the accident. He told me last week it wasn't me who caused it, it was Jeff who was out front and he probably slipped on the stones and he fell and it caused a cascade effect where one after the other fell and that's how it happened. You know, in this world here, it's not perfect. We all know that. Life just happens many times, and it can create scars, whether it be the physical scars that shows on my brother's head or the emotional scars that I've always felt because thinking I had caused that to happen. So today, let's treat each other as best we can so that we don't have the physical scars like with my brother or the emotional scars. If we always practice the golden rule, as I said, life happens, but these types of scars will be very, very limited. Lastly, kids, back 
55 years ago, we didn't wear helmets when we rode our bicycles. Today, we wear helmets. If we had worn the helmets and practiced better safety, we didn't know better, but if we had, my brother probably would not have the scar today. We may have still fallen, but he wouldn't have had the scar. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, help us to treat everybody as kindly and as nice as possible. Help us to always practice the golden rule so that we can live our lives without creating unnecessary scars. Amen. And remember, during these summer months, on these hot days when we want to ride our bikes, wear your helmets. Good morning, everyone. You know, each Sabbath morning, someone comes before us, like I am, to remind us of our obligation to return to God our tithes and our offerings. Our tithes being 10% or one-tenth of our earnings, and our offering being a free will offering from the heart based on what God has given to you. But there may be someone listening when these requests are made. And that person may be saying, you know, you who ask have no idea what I'm experiencing right now. You have no idea of the struggles I'm facing, the financial hardship, the lack of income, whether I can even pay my bills. Well, I've got good news, encouraging words for you today. And they come from God's word. It comes from the book of Luke, Luke chapter six, verse 38. And it says this, give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. Listen to those words. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now that is a cup packed full of God's blessings. Here's what God is saying to me and you today. He's saying, trust me, I'll take care of you. I will care for your needs. Just trust me. There are several ways that you and I can give. One is that we can go to the website, adventistgiving.org. Look for our specific church, the Hensdale, Seventh-day Adventist Church and give directly to our church through that website. You can also go to our church's website, hsdac.org. There's a tab called Giving. Click on that Giving tab and give. You can download the Hinsdale Church app directly to your smartphone and give right in the palm of your hand. And if you prefer, you can drive into our parking lot. Drive and go to the northeast side of the parking lot, northeast side of the church, and you'll find two black boxes containing empty, self-addressed envelopes. Take one of those self-addressed envelopes, place your tithe and offering check and a stamp, and drop it into any mailbox. It'll get to us. Here's the message today. In Malachi, God says two words. He says, prove me and see if I won't bless you. Prove me. Trust God and remember when you return your tithes and offerings to him, you can't be God giving no matter how you try. Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for being the giver, the giver of all things, the giver of life, the giver of love, the giver of all that we have. Thank you for placing within our hearts the joy of returning to you that which you've entrusted to us. May it be used for your glory to spread the message of your soon return. And we thank you again for the gift of eternal life 
Through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Psalm 3, verses 1 through 4. Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. My glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cry to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me with his holy hill. Selah. Rise to rise and 
trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and oh, we'll sing how great, how great.
from His presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from His arms. I couldn't run, couldn't run from His presence. I couldn't run, couldn't run from His arms. and I invite you to join with me in prayer. Our gracious and loving Father in heaven, we are privileged to call upon your name to honor you as creator and redeemer on your holy day, to come before you with praise and thanksgiving, to enter into your courts and to be satisfied with your goodness and blessings, even in troubled times, when we fear the worst and are uncertain about what the future might hold, we know we can look to you and find a surety and a strength that never fails. And so, we trust in you to give us that strength to make our feet like hinds feet that we might walk upon 
the high places, that we would fear no evil, for you are with us, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Father, we lift up those in our congregation, those who may be sick and those who may be suffering from disease. We lift up those who are unemployed and those who are underemployed and looking to you for guidance and direction for the sustenance they need. We lift up those who are fearful and looking to the future with uncertainty that you can give them the certainty of your presence and salvation. Father, we pray that you would give us the heart, the heart of Jesus, that we would remember to be always employed in the work of Christ, to seek and to save the lost, to find those opportunities to share the faith and the hope of the soon coming of Christ, who will restore all things and bring us back into full harmony with your will through the working of your Spirit in our lives. We pray for the work of our church, for our school, for our hospital, that through these means your name can be glorified. And we lift up your servant here this morning, pray that the word spoken will be a balm to our heart, that it will soothe and comfort, it will reassure, it will uplift, and it will correct where correction needs to be so greatly given in our lives that we might reflect more and more of Christ and less and less of self. Thank you for forgiving us our sins and giving us the hope of eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen.
Well, church family, I hope and trust you've enjoyed and been blessed by the worship that we've been able to share together today. I'm really excited to be able to continue our sermon series called Summer in the Psalms. And I shared this last week, but I'll share it again. One of the reasons that I love the Psalms so much is because they're so rich and, and there's something about them that, that just makes them so very relatable. See, the reality is most of the scripture is about God talking to us. But one of the things I love about the Psalms is that it's us, human beings, that are speaking to God, or, or maybe we could say that the Psalms are speaking to God on our behalf. And, and so I, I just love the Psalms, and I love being able to spend time together during the summer in the Psalms because they're so real, they're so true to life. Now, as we are kicking off our sermon today, I want to invite you to pull out your smartphones, and you can go ahead and pull up your camera and shoot this QR code. This QR code will take you to our online study guide that you can fill in the blanks, you can follow along in the sermon, and you can also print it off or email it to yourself or whatever you'd like to do. But uh, it's one of the ways that I want to encourage you to be participating with what we're doing. And I know you're gonna be blessed by what we talk about today because this Psalm, Psalm 3, really talks about real life Things. It talks about what we do when we face the discouragement, when we face uh, division, when we face problems. And the main theme of this psalm is really that things are never as bad as they may seem when the Lord is on our side. So I wonder if you would pray with me as we begin. Father God, Lord, we are coming before you right now opening up the book of Psalms, this beautiful book that you have given us, this beautiful book that speaks so many incredible things, teaches us so many valuable lessons. Father, I pray you would speak now through me and that you would prepare our hearts for the message you would have in Jesus' name. Amen. So this psalm starts out with David crying, Oh Lord, I have so many enemies. So many are against me. So many people are saying that God will never rescue him. And then the final six verses of the psalm really changes the tone. And it's such an inspirational psalm for whatever you might be going through, whatever we might be going through, that I wanted to talk about it today. And one of the things that I really love about the Psalms is that they don't just paint this life as though everything is great, you know, there are no issues. There is, they, they really face real problems. They face real challenges. There's real desperation in this Psalm, and this Psalm directly addresses that desperation. But like I said, it, this psalm, the main point of it is that it, sh it says that things aren't nearly as bad as it might seem when the Lord is on our side. So Psalm 3 teaches us, teaches you and me, how to pray with confidence, knowing that things will get better even when they seem to be as bad as they possibly can be. All right? So let's read Psalm 3 verses one through eight together. Here I'm reading from the New Living Translation. So many are saying, God will never rescue him, but you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are the glory, the one who holds, you are my glory, the one who holds my head high. I cried out to the Lord and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept. Yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. Verse uh, 6. I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Verse 7. Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Verse 8. Victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. So let's get into this incredible psalm. So here's the story. But this psalm doesn't just come out of nowhere. 
It's not like David's just sitting around thinking, you know, what, what would be something good that I could talk about or write about or whatever. Here's the story. Now, you, you know Absalom was David's third son, right? So we know that David had these sons in order. He had Amnon. Then he had this son named Heliab, who he, the only time he's ever mentioned is is reference to his birth. So we are uh, we assume that he died early on. So David's firstborn son is Amnon, and then his thirdborn son is Absalom. I want to share a little bit with you about uh, Amnon's life. If you if you don't remember, Amnon raped his half sister Tamar, Absalom's sister, right? And Absalom was so angry about what had happened to his sister that he swore revenge. So it, it, it took two years, but Absalom finally arranged to have Amnon killed in, in retaliation, retaliation for raping Tamar, right? So Absalom has Amnon killed. And, and when this deed is done, Absalom is terrified. He thinks he's gonna, he's gonna be punished. He thinks that, that David's gonna kill him. So Absalom takes off and he, he goes into exile for three years. When he finally does return to Jerusalem, David, his own father, refuses to see him. And then two more years passed. So five years in total, right? And, and David finally agrees to see Absalom, but when he does, tensions are super high and they never fully reconcile. So over time, Absalom begins to hate his own father. He starts not only just hating his father, but he starts wanting the things that his father has. So I'm sure there was probably some sort of righteous indignation in his mind. He, he probably rationalized that that he should be the one that gets this king, right? He, he was probably thinking, well, you know, I could probably do things so much better than my father does. And so the plan is played out that he will try to take over the kingdom. Second Samuel chapter 15. It tells us that Absalom starts currying favor with the people. And he, he goes around and he presents himself as, as one who is interested in the people. And, and he tells the people, look, I'm far more capable at, at running the kingdom than my father is. I'm the one that cares about your troubles. I'm the one that, that wants to get justice for your complaints, right? I'm the one that, that understands your frustration so I can bring about real positive change, right? So 2 Samuel chapter 15 verse 6 says that Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And once Absalom felt secure, he made his move for the throne. He went to Hebron, he followed, he assembled his followers, he has himself anointed as the king. And so not only does he have a, a group of followers and not only has he been anointed as the king, he has this considerable army behind him. And so he rallies the troops and he marches on Jerusalem. Absalom marches on his own father and it forces David to flee for his life. So here's, here's this really incredible scene. I mean, think about this. David is driven from his throne and, and when a king leaves his throne, I mean, that is indescribable humiliation. But, but what makes matters worse is it's not just coming from like some, some Gentile king that has, has sacked the city and, and made him run. The very one that's making him run for his life is his own son. So I, I imagine that this absolutely devastates David. I, I imagine this completely crushes his heart. That this rebellion, this treachery is not coming from, from a godless person or, or someone that's from a different country. It's from his own, from his own tribe, from his own people, from his own son. And so here's the point here, and this is an important point, but when we look at Psalm three, we recognize that this Psalm was written while David was fleeing from the armies of Absalom, while David was on the run for his own life, trying to avoid having his own son kill him, David sits down and writes Psalm 3. 
I don't doubt that that David's anguish, that his frustration, that his that his heartbreak is magnified by the fact that, that his adversaries were primarily from his own people. The, the ones that were closest to him, the ones in whom he had at one time placed his confidence, right? The ones that he had shared meals with, the ones that, that he had placed his trust in. And it's now those same people that are turning around and, and they're spewing these bitter, hateful accusations at David. They begin to, to throw, probably throw David's sin back in his own face. You know, the, the relationship with Bathsheba and, and the, so the, the affair with Bathsheba and then the murder of Uriah and then David's failure as a father to Amnon and Absalom. So I'm sure these people are throwing all this, this history back into David's face. I'm sure they're saying things like, you know, David, you know, uh, God's not going to turn a blind eye to these sins. You know, the, the, God doesn't put up with that sort of thing, David, right? And so here we learn our very first lesson from this psalm. The very first lesson that I, I want us to, to take away from this psalm is this. It's, it's that we ought to bring our complaints to God. That's what we see David do. And David is the man after God's own heart. And he was at a place in his life where it seems that God has turned his back on David. So David complains. I mean, I think you would too. I think I would too. But to whom does David complain? In verses one and two, we see that the, the heart of this, the heart of this complaint it is is found in the repeated word many the word many comes up three different times in the first two verses david's troubles are real david's troubles are growing david's troubles are, are insurmountable but he prayed and he told the lord what his enemies were doing and saying so that, that's the next thing we come to we we see that he tells the lord what his enemies are doing and what his enemies are saying. Verse 1a says, Oh Lord, I have so many enemies. You know, it, it, it was enough that David's own son Absalom, his beloved son Absalom, had declared himself to be his father's enemy. But many people are now turning and, and, and going against him. They're joining Absalom's rebellion. These are people, these are not just, you know, these aren't strangers. These aren't just, you know, people that Absalom was able to rally around. These are people that David knew. These are people that David loved. And these are people that David had trusted. And these same people are now determined to kill him. I mean, think, think about that, right? Everywhere David looks, friends have become foes. Everywhere he, he looks, he's surrounded with enemies. I think the reality is this can happen to us too. But life has this way of, of, of bringing us to, to tight places sometimes where we're surrounded by people with evil intentions or we're, we're just surrounded with evil intentions. You know, the, the, the people that are supposed to have our back the people that we're supposed to be able to depend on. It's those same people that, that when they turn their backs on us, that hurts us. And, and they can work to hurt us rather than help us. Verse 1b says, so, so many are against me. Some of your Bibles say, many are they that rise up against me. Now, this word rise up is, is military language here. David was outnumbered by his enemies. His enemies were growing. More and more people were switching their allegiances, and, and they were no longer pledging their allegiance to David. They were, they were pledging their allegiance to take a stand against David. And so David tells the Lord that many people were against him, and, and the, the ranks of those who were seeking to, to bring about his demise those ranks are growing more and more every day. 
So, so David doesn't just tell the Lord what his enemies are doing. He also tells the Lord what his enemies are saying. David lets the Lord know what, what is being said. Because as, as if to, to add insult to injury to this whole treachery and treason, people are starting to say things like, God will never rescue him. I mean, check out verse 2. David complains, so many are saying that God will never rescue him. Now, now, some versions put it this way. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Now, I, I want you to know, I have met a lot of people and I have seen some pretty bad cases. But I have, you know, some cases where I'm like, man, you know, only God can really help. Only God can really intervene. Only God can make this right. But I have never seen anyone where I thought, man, not even God can save this person. But, but that's what's being said about David, right? I, I've never been in a place where I thought, man, not even God can save this person. But that's the thing that is being said about David, that the word on the street about David's situation it is that he, it is so bleak, it is so desperate that not even God can save David. The logical conclusion was, well, you, you had an affair with Bathsheba, you murdered her husband Uriah, um, you let your sons run wild. It kind of makes sense. You've turned your back on God, God's turned his back on you. So keeping all of this in mind, right, David feels that even God has turned his back on him. So David complains. David complains. But to whom would you complain? I would complain. I think you would complain. Who would you complain to? In verses 1 and 2, David brings his complaints to the Lord. David brings his complaints to the Lord and that's what you and I should do too. It's like the words of that hymn, I must tell Jesus all of my troubles. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly listens. He ever loves and cares for his own. So we, we bring our complaints to the Lord. And the second thing we do is we place our confidence in the Lord. In verses three through six, David shifts his focus to the Lord. And that, by the way, is the only sure way to face and overcome the overwhelming battles in life, is to shift our, to shift our attention, our focus to the Lord. James uh, Boyce wrote this, he says, when a believer gazes too long at his enemies, the force arrayed against him seems to grow in size until it appears to be overwhelming. But when he turns his thoughts to God, a God is seen in his true great stature and the enemies shrink to manageable proportions. And so that's what David does. He looks at the schemes. He looks at the low blows. He looks at the, the threats of his enemies. And he reminds himself in prayer of who God is and what God has done for him. So, so this is what we should do. We should place our confidence in who the Lord is. Now, at this point, most people ha had written David off, right? They, they say, hey, the Lord has forsaken David. There's no help for him. But check out what David does in verse three, how he responds. He says, but you, O Lord, are a shield around me. You are my glory. You are the one that, that lifts my head high. Now pay attention to how personally David describes God. David describes God as a shield around me, as my glory, as the lifter of my head. I, I want to get to these, right? Okay. These are, are not the words of one who really believes they've been forsaken by God. These are, are the ones, these are the words of someone that has a testimony. These are the words of someone that has a real personal relationship with God. So I want to look very briefly at, at the three of these, right? The first one, the Lord is my shield. Now, 
Abraham defeated the enemies of Sodom and Gomorrah, but he didn't take any of the spoils of war with him because he didn't want the heathens to come along and accuse him of, of stealing from them to get rich. So in Genesis 15, 1, God says, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. Psalm 84, 11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. God is a shield for those that trust him. Now, you already know that a shield is a, is a round military instrument, right? That a soldier would hold in one hand to, to deflect the arrows and the swords and the, and the spears that would come his way, and they would fight with the other hand, right? The, the problem with the shield is it can only provide limited protection. It can only provide protection on one side. And, and obviously, when you're holding up a shield on this side, your flank is exposed. But check this out. David says that the Lord is a shield around me. The Lord covers every side. We have sovereign, complete, unfailing protection in God. God is a shield around us. Number two, it says, the Lord is my glory. Now, when, when we see this word glory, it's, it's typically referring to the glory of God. But when it's used in reference to humans, it's talking about dignity, it's talking about honor. So, so what David is really saying here is that his sense of self-worth, his sense of identity is firmly, totally, completely rooted in God. Now remember, David's been banished from his throne. He's had to flee from his city. He, he has all these people that have turned against him. And yet David declares that his honor was not in his throne. His honor was not in his city. His not honor was not in his citizens. His honor was not in the vast armies. His honor was not in his riches. David says that the Lord is my glory. The Lord is my honor. David is literally saying, I am somebody because God notices me. The one true king of heaven and earth the lord is my glory now the third thing is he says that god is the lifter of his head you might need a little bit of, a, of an explanation about this in second samuel 15 verse 30 it says that david fled to the mount of olives and when he fled to the mount of olives you know he's running for his life right he he flees to the mount of olives with weeping He's barefoot, and he has his head covered. Now, of all the people who, who were with him, they all had their heads covered. And, and when that happens, it, it means that you're, you're full of shame. It, it means that you're, you're worried about what's coming next. What David had been through had caused he himself and everyone that was with him to cover their head. Now, in the ancient world, when subjects would bow before a monarch, he would judge their case. They would they would take their case to him and, and basically plead for their plead plead for their cause, plead for their life. And if the king decided to to rule against the subject, he would place his foot on their neck and he would express his condemnation. But if the king heard the story and decided to vindicate the person, he would grab that person and lift their head up. And so what David is saying here is, I have presented my case to the Lord and I am confident that he hears my case and that he will lift my head up. That's what God will do for those that trust in him. He will lift your head up. So, Hinsdale Church family, place your confidence in who the Lord is and place your confidence in what the Lord has done. Place your confidence in what the Lord has done. David was confident that, that God was his shield. David was confident that God was his glory. David was confident that God was his head lifter because David knew what the Lord had already done for him. David had this, this, this file of faith 
events, right? That he could pull, he could open up that file drawer and he could pull up anything and he could review. He could review this, this file of, of events that God had done for him to remind himself of the fullness, of the faithfulness, of the goodness of God in his own life. And this faith file reminded David of three things that the Lord had done for him. This faith file had reminded David of three things that the Lord had done for him. The, the first is that God answers prayer. Verse 4 says, I cry out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. Okay? This expresses the fervency of David's prayer. You know, there's a time for quiet, contemplative, reflective prayer where we allow God to speak to us. But there's also a time to cry out to the Lord, to completely just lay everything out there. And David is remembering the times in which God has answered David's prayers. So David <clears throat> remembers that God answers prayer. And he also remembers that God sustains. See, with the increasing trouble that, that David was facing, you would think that he would probably be up all night pacing a hole in the floor, right? He, he's, he, when you're troubled, when you're concerned, when you're worried, it's hard to sleep, right? David was able to sleep. He was able to lay down, but he didn't just lay down with like, you know, one eye open, kind of always watching for his enemies at night. No, it, it says that David lay down and he went to sleep. Now, now everybody knows that we're most vulnerable when we sleep, right? That's when the enemy can, can sneak in and attack and kill us as we sleep. But David lay down and went to sleep and he woke up the next morning. How did he wake up the next morning? How, how was that possible? David says, the Lord sustained me. So church family, what, what, whatever you're facing, whatever, you're, whatever you've been through, what, whatever is knocking at your door, you are still here. The Lord has sustained you. The Lord is continuing to sustain you. You laid down, you went to sleep, but you woke up again because the Lord sustains you. So God answers prayer. He sustains. And number three, he relieves fear. Verse six says, I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Now, now in, in, in the first few verses, we talked about his many foes, right? And, and then we see that this comes in, in concrete terms. Thousands of people, many thousands of people had literally pledged against David and, and they were surrounding him. This wasn't just an exaggeration. Literally thousands of people had sworn allegiance to Absalom, allegiance against David, but David wasn't afraid because David knew who his God was and what his God had done for him. And David was determined not to allow fear to dictate how he would respond. Psalm 3 is a prayer, but it's not until we get to verses 7 and 8 that David actually starts making requests of the Lord. He first brings his complaint to the Lord, then he places his confidence in the Lord, and now in the closing verses of this psalm, he, we give our conflict to the Lord because he is willing, he is able, and he is ready to fight for us and give us the victory. In verse 7, David says, Arise, O Lord. And, and this is a, a word that is filled with all kinds of meaning. Meaning, because when he calls on God to arise, he's expecting God to act on his behalf. This whole, this whole arise, O Lord, this phrase, it's packed with meaning. Because in Numbers 10.35, that's when Moses led the children of Israel through the wilderness. In, in Numbers 10.35, whenever the ark, it says, whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before you. See, Israel, the nation of Israel, constantly trusted that the Lord would fight their battles. Psalm 68.1 says, God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. But David doesn't take matters into his own hands. He asks God to keep his enemies from hurting him. He trusts that God will 
fight his battles for him. So we give our conflict to God because God fights for us. God fights for us. God fights for you. Hey, have you thought about the whatever you're facing? Have you thought about the, the frustrating things you're, you're going through? Have you thought about the, the worries that you have? How does it make you feel to know that God fights for you? What does it say in Romans 8? It says, well, what then shall we say about these things? If God can be for us, who can be against us? Man, I, 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 I want to tell you something. The same God that fought for a way for you to get to heaven will fight for you on your way to heaven. I, I, I'm going to say that again. The same God that fought for a way for you to get to heaven will fight for you on your way to heaven. And not only will he fight for you, he will give you the victory. Verse 8 says, victory comes from you, O Lord. David's enemies were saying that there's no salvation for him in God. But they didn't have the last word. Because it's not human beings that get to say who, had, who gets salvation and who doesn't. It's only God. Salvation is God's business. Finally, David prays, may you bless your people. Now, the, the final words of this psalm, the final words of this prayer, make it very clear that this is a personal testimony, but it's not just personal. It's also for others. It's for more than just David. It's for every single person that trusts in the Lord. Do you need God's blessing in your life? Are, are, are there some battles that you can't win? Are, are there some things that you're worried about and you're concerned about? Let the Lord sustain you. God will fight for you. In fact, he, he already is. So, friends, take your complaints to the Lord. Take your concerns to the Lord. I think about that hymn that you know well. We all know well. But I think it would be good and wise to revisit the words again. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we don't, don't carry everything to God in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise, forsake you? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms, he will take and shield you. You will find a solace there. Let's pray together. Father, as we have taking a look at this psalm, this incredible prayer of David. Lord, we see that there are lessons that we can learn in our own lives. And Father, I pray for every single person that's in the sound of my voice, every single person that's watching this online or on TV. Father, I pray that as we place our trust, place our confidence in you, that you will sustain us, that you will fight for us. And Father, I pray that we will remember the ways in which you have blessed and that we will give you all the honor, all the glory, all the credit. Father, I know right now, I know right now, there are all kinds of concerns about health, about families, about marriages, about kids, about school, about jobs, about where to live, Father, I pray that as we place these things before you, that you will fight our battles for us. And I pray these things in the precious and mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us at the Hinsdale Seventh-day Adventist Church. I want to invite you to join us again next week at the same time, the same place, as we continue our sermon series, 
summer in the Psalms. Go in the grace of God and share the grace of God.